uh, there was a ridiculous, in my opinion, New York Times article that I had to fend off a lot of email about, saying that basically this was a, there were all these things coming out that suggested the Big Bang, our, our standard picture wasn't true. And the point is that James Webb is designed to do a number of things, but one of the things it's designed to do is to look back to the earliest, the first light, to the earliest stars, the first galaxies, because in our picture we're trying to understand how they evolved, and, and, and a really big question is, is uh, you know, we see large black holes, or what look like black holes, that are things called quasars. Black holes are really the most, if, if they're really black holes, they're really the most visible objects in the universe, because if they're galaxy-sized, as some of these supermassive black holes appear to be, then um, if things fall, when things fall into them, they emit a lot of light, and the only explanation for these things called quasars, which are the most luminous objects in the universe pretty well, is that they're huge supermassive black holes and things are falling into them. They are, they, they could just be things that look like black holes, and, and I've written an article with, uh, with a, a colleague, and um, I see a professor here from, from Simon Fraser, who was a former, who was at my university when I was chair of, at Case Western, who knows about, about this, but um, saying that maybe, we, you know, maybe it just looks like a black hole and it walks like a black hole, but it might not quack like a black hole. Mm. And, um, um, but anyway, uh, so the question is chicken and egg argument. There are a lot of these things in the early universe. How the heck did they form? Did black holes form first and then galaxies coalesce around them? Or did, or did small black holes form in, the, in galaxies and then combine and merge? And these are some of the questions that James Webb would answer. But one of the things that is surprising is there are more galaxies, apparently well-formed galaxies, because galaxies take a time, time to look like ours. Our, our Milky Way galaxy cannibalized lots of small galaxies, and still is, you know, the large Magellanic clouds and the small Magellanic clouds, and I'm still allowed to call them Magellanic clouds. Um, they, they, uh, they're small satellite galaxies that will be cannibalized, and the, and, and the Andromeda galaxy, which is that beautiful galaxy that you see all the pictures of that looks just like our own galaxy, um, and it is essentially just like our own galaxy, a nice spiral galaxy. It's heading towards us at about 100 kilometers per second. In about five billion years, it will collide with our galaxy. Not much, it sounds like a dramatic thing. It won't, you really won't know. The night sky, it'll get bigger and bigger in the night sky until it becomes part of our galaxy, and our, our galaxy will rearrange and become a, probably something like an elliptical galaxy, but there won't be much collision of stars or anything because most of it's empty space. But, uh, so that, that'll be a big merger. But, so galaxies to form their present structure ha cannibalize small galaxies, etc. And I think people had expected to see these nascent galaxies in James Webb at early times that looked very different, and some of them do. But what seems surprising is there's more well-formed galaxies than imagined. And that's difficult to understand in terms of what's called the standard model of cosmology. But, you know, it's just, it, it, it doesn't kill any, it's just, it's, it, it, it's interesting. And, and, and the trouble, of course, with our universe is we have a sample of one that we can measure. And most of the predictions of our models are statistical because uh, that's how we, you know, we, we can work on, it turns out we think all of the structure in our universe comes from quantum mechanics and things are statistical. And so you can make statistical estimates about what's likely to happen. But rare things happen all the time, and, and, and tales of distributions happen all the time. And, and there's another thing that, you know, is kind of claimed to be a big challenge, the Big Bang, the rate of expansion of the universe. Some, uh, two different ways of measuring it come up with a sort of a f two to four percent difference. Of, the rate at which distant galaxies are moving away from us. And some people are making a big deal about that. And, and I'm a natural skeptic about everything, especially observations, new observations, because they're often wrong. And, um, and I also am old, which helps. <laughs> um, and I'm old enough to remember when I was a young faculty member, there were two measurements of what are called the Hubble constant, this expansion rate of the universe. And one measurement was 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec, doesn't matter what those things are, it's a number, um, and pl uh, pl with an uncertainty of plus or minus five, 100 plus or minus five. And there was a, the other set of measurements were 
42, a lovely important number for cosmology, 42, I was, I was rooting for that, but anyway, 42 plus or minus five. Okay, now, so it's obvious that the observers, their, their estimates of their errors were probably underestimates. Okay, now the difference is something like 69 versus 72. And by, I mean, by the way, at the time, when it was measured to be 100 or 50, more or less, I said, it's going to be 75, because it has to be somewhere between. That's what it basically is. So, but though air bars and those things, but 68 versus 70, the air bars are like plus or minus one now, apparently. And so people are making out a big deal about this potential difference. And maybe it's, it's a big deal, but it's a difficult thing to do, and, and it's hard to estimate uncertainties in an experiment you can estimate your uncertainties because you can twist the dials and you can see how things change. You can estimate the systematics. But when you're doing an observation and you can't twist the dials of the universe, then it's harder to know what you don't know. I mean, really, when you're, when you're estimating the systematic uncertainties of a scientific experiment, you're estimating the things in some sense that you don't know, the things that you think could, give you, could bias your experiment. And of course, you can always miss those. And science is full of examples of missing those. Scientists try really hard to estimate them and, and, and you know, really do a good job on the whole. But so I'm less, uh, you know, there, there are things that are interesting and that makes life interesting, but I don't see anything that causes me to, um, you know, to jump up and down. And, and in retrospect, it's going to be great. We'll have a whole night with you know, my answer to one question. <laughs> but um, I love it. Uh, they, <laughs> I, I'll, I'm, hmm, this will be self-serving, but that's okay, I am. Um, <laughs> the, there was a different time in the 19, early 1990s when I got involved in looking at the data from cosmology and, and looking at all the data, it appeared to me and a colleague of mine at Chicago that, um, it took me a while to convince him of that, but we did, eventually did, um, that the data was inconsistent with the picture of cosmology that we all knew to be true. And that time was that we live in a flat universe dominated by dark matter, and, uh, and um, that was the standard model of cosmology. And the data was simply inconsistent with that. And, and so we wrote a paper arguing that the only solution to make it consistent would be something that's more ridiculous than the data, is to say that empty space had energy. And, and in fact, to make it consistent, empty space would have to have 70% of the energy of the universe. It was ludicrous. And we wrote that paper primarily because um, I felt it, would, it pointed out that some of the data must be wrong. Okay? And I remember talking to a few people. I remember talking to Saul Perlmuter, where I, visited, I spent a, a month at, at Berkeley, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And um, he was looking at a way to measure um, the total energy of the universe, in a, in a, in a sense by looking at supernovae, the, the rate at which the universe expands. And, he, and I remember him saying, well, just, we'll, we'll prove this wrong. You know, that was in 1995, and three years later, um, they proved it right. And I was more shocked than anyone else. I, I thought the data had to be wrong, um, but, but it meant we had to have a, the biggest revolution in cosmology since I've been a cosmologist, that, that empty space had energy. And Saul and, and Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. Um, Brian Keating, I had on my podcast mm -hmm. um, pretty recently, and he, I don't know if you get this sense, because I know you, you've talked to him, um, do you get the sense that he's trying to look at uh, different models, uh, trying to steer away from the Big Bang model? Well, well I look, of course he is, because that's, you know, every, that's the other thing that scientists want to do, is they want to go in every day and prove their colleagues are wrong, right? It's I mean, that's, thing. and yeah. it's really important to realize that because everyone thinks it's, you know, everyone wants to keep the status quo, that science, scientists are invested in, in not allowing, you know, some fringe ideas to, be, to happen. Now, scientists are people, that's a well-guarded secret. But, um, and so therefore, yeah, people do want a, their own pet idea to be right and other people to be wrong. But, but, um, but science progresses by, proving your colleagues wrong, in a sense. And so, yeah, Brian, I, you know, he's an observer, and I think, obviously, he would like to make a discovery that uh, requires us to change our picture. But that doesn't happen very often. Most of the time, when there are... When you read something that's astounding, most of the time it's wrong. 
Remember that when you read the newspapers. Remember it if you read the scientific literature. When I read scientific papers, you know, I have this rule, this mantra I learned from the publisher of the New York Times, which I used to write for. Um, uh, and he, uh, the, he said, I like to keep an open mind, but not so open that my brains fall out. And so that's my mantra. If, if I read an article in a scientific journal, I say, in order for me to accept that, my brains have to fall out. I, I think it's likely wrong. Now, it doesn't have to be, but likely is the key word. What's likely?